we have been called by God and we've been chosen for this hour. We are no better than anyone else. We're no better than any other denomination, except we have been called by his name. I worship you, Jesus. As quickly as you can. And we'll need some grace here. But would you find somebody that's not in your age group? If you're a younger preacher, a younger saint, would you find somebody that's older? If you're somebody that's an elder, you're older, would you find somebody that's younger? Give us some grace here. If somebody thinks you're an elder and you don't think you're an elder, give them grace. But would you find somebody right now and would you get a hold of them? And we need to respond one more time to what we've heard and felt, the direction we've received. Could you turn this whole auditorium Instead of just a fellowship hall for a minute, could you turn this into a response to the clear sound of the Word of God that we've heard in this meeting this morning? I'm not talking about a little transition prayer here, folks. I'm talking about lifting them up before the Lord right now. I don't know how you feel. I am proud, Holy Ghost, sanctified proud to belong to a movement that contains the ministries of young men like we just heard speak this morning. I am grateful and sanctified proud of that. Psalm 105, verse 17. God sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. We've heard the word this morning. We've heard doctrine preached here this morning. I'm so grateful. We've heard direction given this morning. Not just the direction of a man speaking to us and cheerleading us, but spiritual direction. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is speaking and has spoken to the church this morning. The Holy Ghost has descended on Columbia. Brother Jaron just told me that next door over in the youth center, there's young people receiving the Holy Ghost slain out on the floor. God's moving among us today. This is a day of destiny and impact. My heart's full, and I'm going to ask your forgiveness because there's a thousand thanks that I would love to give. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here. But I want to talk to you about the word that we've been hearing this morning. So if you've got a Bible... I wish you would lift it straight in the air. And I wish you would pray one simple prayer. God, would you reveal your word to me today? I, I mean that as a very specific prayer. God has a word that he's speaking in our midst today. I'm sorry to get in your space and in your face. But the Bible tells us that it's not the clapping of the hands, which is our unique North American custom and culture. It's not the clapping of the hands that's the center of spiritual warfare. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. One time in the Word, it tells us, oh, clap your hands, all ye people. But many times, it tells us to cry aloud, lift up your voice, shout unto the Lord. So I wish you'd hold that Word up, and I wish you'd pray a prayer out loud and say, God, reveal your Word to me today. Not just let it go in my ears, but God, let it settle in my heart today. Aroko yesa masho saba. You gotta 
you got to understand, I'll cut my time if you'll take this time. Would you lift up your voice? I, I'm sorry to get in your face. I'm sorry to invade your space. But if the apostolics would lift up your voice, there's something loosed among us today. But you got to get it. It's not enough for the two preachers up here to have it. you got to get what God is sending your way today. Let's show some. Reveal your word, God. Reveal your word, God. You may be seated. What I have to say to you in the next few minutes cannot have any effect at all unless we first establish the absolute and essential power of the word of God. The word that we've heard preached today is not a denominational plank in a campaign. The word that we've heard preached today is not a couple of men trying to sway us into believing their opinion. What they have been preaching to us is the supernatural word of God. Moses said in Deuteronomy 8 and 3, And God humbled thee, and he suffered you to hunger, and he fed you with manna, which thou knewest not. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make you know one thing. All your wilderness wandering, all the trials you went through, God wanted you to learn this one thing. Man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth mouth of the Lord doth man live. Solomon said in 1 Kings 8, Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his promise which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. You believe what you want to believe, but when the word of God goes forth, not one word is wasted. Not one word falls to the ground unfulfilled. Not one word dies. David said in Psalm 56, In God will I praise His word. In the Lord will I praise His word. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. We praise God all the time. We give honor to whom honor is due, and we should. But aren't you grateful for the word of God? In God I will praise His word. David said in Psalm 138, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name Jesus name people God has magnified his word above all his name we love the name we worship the name we sing in the name we pray in the name we baptize in the name but the name comes to us out of the word because the name is the name of the person who is the word? Psalm 119 is this long litany on the word of God. Verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Verse 16, I will not forget thy word. Verse 25, quicken thou me according to thy word. Verse 28, strengthen thou me according to thy word. Verse 42, I trust in thy word. Verse 58, be merciful to me according to thy word. Verse 74, I have hoped in thy word. Verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Verse 105, you know this one. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it works like this. The word will shine just enough light for you to walk to the edge of where the word has led you. And don't you worry. When you get to the edge of the revelation you've received and the direction you've received, God is going to meet you in his word one more time because he'll give you enough light to walk in. And then he's waiting to see what you're going to do with that. 
Verse 116, uphold me according unto thy word. Verse 133, order my steps in thy word. I wish somebody lift up your hand and pray that over yourself. God, order my steps in your word. God, order my steps in your word. Every step that I take, every decision that I make, every direction that I head, God, order my steps in your word. Verse 160, thy word is true from the beginning. Verse 160. 61, my heart standeth in awe of thy word. Verse 162, I rejoice at thy word. That's what you felt this morning every time one of these preachers opened up the word of God and began to say it and speak it and expound it and your heart leaped within you. My heart rejoices at the word of the Lord. Verse 169, give me understanding according to thy word. Verse 170, deliver me according to thy word. And 172, my tongue shall speak of thy word. The psalmist is trying to tell us something that's so simple yet so profound. It's the word. It's the word. It's the word. It's in the word that we find the great God that we praise. It's in the word that we find the message that we preach. It's in the word that we find our strength and our deliverance. It's in the word that we get our direction. Is there anybody here that has a hunch after all the years you've been in Pentecost that you haven't been studying the equivalent of a religious encyclopedia, but you've been walking in the supernatural word of God? Isaiah said in 40, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. In 55, he spoke for the Lord and said, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, empty, formless, useless, but it shall, it shall, it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall, it shall, it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. I wish you'd lift up your hands. I'm going to get in your face a little bit this morning. I wish you'd lift up your hands and let the word that's already been spoken find a place in you. It's not nearly enough to hear a message and pat the preacher on the back and say, good sermon, good message, but we need to let the word lodge in us. So rabba, makera so. Jeremiah 20, verse 9, the prophet, the weeping prophet, he had good reason to cry. He had opposition from everybody. And Jeremiah's worst enemies were not the children of Israel that he preached to. They were the false prophets that had a false message of ease and comfort and you don't have to do anything. God's obligated to us. And they caused Jeremiah more grief. And so Jeremiah, the great prophet, decided that I guess the fire of opposition all around me is so hot that I'm just going to zip it. I'm going to shut my mouth. And he said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But Jeremiah found something out very quickly. That the fire of opposition that was around him was far less powerful than the fire of the word of God that was within him. He said, his word was in mine heart as a burning fire. It was shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing. So I I couldn't stay. I couldn't sit down. I couldn't shut up. I couldn't stop because there's something about the power of the Word of God. Ezekiel talked to the Lord. Son of man, can these bones live? It's dead. It's dry. It's devastated. And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And again he saith unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones bones, hear not my words, hear not my sermon, hear not my opinion, but hear the word of the Lord. Mm. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 8, where the word of a king is, there is power. Psalm 107, one of my favorite verses out of Psalms, verse 20, he sent his word and healed them, 
and delivered them from their destructions. He sent his word and healed them. Do you realize that because the word of the Lord has been loosed in this room this morning that there's healing power in the room, not because we're having a quote unquote healing service, but just because the word of the Lord has been loosed and released. And when the word is sent, it carries healing with it. He sent his word and healed them and even stuff Israel had done to themselves. It was their own fault and their own stupidity, but the Word delivered them from their destructions. I wish you would lift your hands. I wish you would receive the Word because while the Word is being preached, it's not in the voice of the preacher. It's in the Word that he's preaching, and the Word has loosed healing here today. Mm. Is there anybody that believes that the word that we're believing is a supernatural word? That's just the Old Testament. We haven't even turned the page into the New Testament. And we heard it already this morning and in this conference. And we've anchored to it and we'll never move. That in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word... So when we're preaching this book, it's not the same as getting a lecture together. It's not the same as doing a speech for your English class. It's not the same as putting a doctoral thesis together when we're preaching the Word. The Word contains within its pages the one who wrote the Word, the one who gave the Word, and the one who is the Word. So when this goes forth, he goes forth. And when this is exalted, he's exalted. And when this is obeyed, he's obeyed. Oh my goodness, if you got a Bible, just wave it for a minute. The Word, the Word, the Word. There's power in this because it's a supernatural book. In the New Testament, there are two major words that refer to the Word. Two major words by which the Word of God describes itself. The first one you know very, very well. The first one is Logos. Logos is a broad term. It's often used in a very technical, theological sense over 300 times in the New Testament. Logos refers to the totality of the Word of God, the total revelation of God, if you will. And Logos also, of course, refers to Jesus Christ, who is the Word made flesh. He is God manifest in flesh. So this is the Logos, the living Word, the total revelation of God. I'm glad that today we have heard excerpts pulled out of the total revelation of God. And we get excited about that because we want to obey the whole counsel of the Word of God. Our problem in Pentecost many times is that when someone else goes to an extreme, we feel like we've got to go to the opposite extreme to counterbalance them. And we have to be very careful that we don't do that and we don't act like that. Truth is truth. Truth doesn't need a counterbalance every time somebody moves this way. You don't need to move that way. We, we did this years ago, I remember as a young man and then a young minister with, with the whole deal about the grace of God. I remember because of seeing people turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, loose living, and, and just turning it into almost a joke. And they went that way so far. And I remember as a young man, um, in that stage of my life, many of the people I looked to, they had wavered and they had moved and they had walked away. And I remember Uh, catching myself one day. I was sitting in a pew and the preacher was preaching on the grace of God and I was arguing with him in my mind. I was quoting every scripture on law and commandments and obedience and doctrine that would come to my mind. And I was sitting there arguing with him in my spirit because
because I realized that he had gone way off to that extreme. And I didn't want to be part of that extreme. But the answer to one extreme is not to go to the other extreme. The answer is to stand on the truth of the Word of God and not move no matter who goes which direction. That's the answer. So there's another word that the Word of God uses to describe itself, and we're afraid of this word because some people have taken it to an extreme. And that word is rima. Rima is not exactly the same as logos. They refer to the same Word of God in the New Testament. Rima is used about 70 times. And it focuses attention not on the whole counsel of God, but on a specific word from God. A precise direction of Scripture for a particular person or a particular time or a particular meeting or a particular circumstance. It's used about 70 times in the New Testament. Now, some people have taken this Rima concept to a horrible extreme where they think that everything that passes out of their mouth because they claim to serve God, that it automatically becomes the Word of God. And so they prophesy over each other new cars and new houses and boats and vacation homes, and that's, that's absolute garbage. But just because somebody has gone to this extreme doesn't mean we need to walk to the other extreme and turn what we believe into a collection of favorite verses that we quote to defend our doctrine. Do you realize what happened here this morning? These guys weren't just repeating a list of scriptures that they had learned to repeat, to push buttons, to crank up a crowd. They were giving us revelation from the Word of God. They were unfolding the principles of the Word of God and the commandments of the Word of God. And in so doing, they didn't just give us logos. Logos is the total revelation of God. But we don't just need Logos, we need the Rima word. We need a specific word from God to come among us and to come into us and to be received by us. Because Rima is not separate from Scripture. It's not different than Scripture. And it certainly doesn't supersede Scripture. Here's how it works. Logos is the total revelation of God. And Rima is a specific word from God that comes out of that total revelation to you in a particular circumstance. You say, I don't know if I believe that or not. Well, you've already done it, so you're too late. Because you've been reading the Word of God. It's happened to you many times. You read the Word of God and you say, I never saw that before. You've read that verse a thousand times before. But on that day, in the middle of that trial, in the middle of that circumstance, in the middle of what you were going through, all of a sudden you were reading the same verse. Maybe you even had it underlined because you'd read it so many times. But in the middle of that circumstance, a Rima word, a specific word, a word of direction and confirmation jumped out of the Logos and got all over you. So you've already done it. So don't tell me you don't believe it. You're already a practicer of it. Because the Word of God, whether the Word refers to itself as Logos or Rima, it's all inspired. It's all eternal. It's all dynamic. It's all miraculous. So it doesn't matter whether this Word is being written down or spoken. Whether it's general or specific, that doesn't alter the essential character of the Word of God. Now this is very important. Because if you say no to the Word, you've said no to God. Away with this notion that you can be a Christian and you can attend a church and you're apostolic because it says apostolic on your church sign. Or you're Pentecostal because it says Pentecostal on your church sign. Unless you are living your life subject to the Word of God, you're only fooling yourself. If you say no to any part of the Word of God, you're saying no to the God who wrote the Word and the God who is the Word. Uh, Some people say, well, the Logos is the written word, but now we've got Rima. That's the spoken word. That's, That's an extreme position. It's better to say it this way. Logos is the total revelation. 
Rima is a specific revelation that comes out of the Logos, and they work together. James chapter 1, verse 22. Let's look at this. But be ye doers of the Logos, and not hearers only, because if you do that, you only deceive yourself. If you watch the trend in the New Testament church, as the Word of God multiplies, the church multiplies. As the Word grows, the church grows. Mark 16, 20. They went forth and they preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and he confirmed the logos the revelation that they had the revelation that they preached he confirmed the logos with signs following and so as a result you start to read these acts 12 24 the word of god grew and multiplied acts 13 49 the word was published throughout all the region acts 19 20 so mightily grew the word of god and prevailed so as the word prevails, the church prevails. As the word grows, the church grows. As the word is exalted in a community, the church of God is exalted in a community. And so you read things like this from the pen of Paul, 2 Thessalonians 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word, the logos, the revelation of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Paul said, you know what? I don't need you to pray that I'll get over all my trials. I don't need you to pray that I'll get delivered from prison again. I don't need you to pray that my enemies shall their mouth. I don't need you to pray that I'll have extra money at the end of the month. I just want you to pray one thing. Brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. That's the prayer. We need to pray over every church service. Pray that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. Because if we let the word loose, we've let God loose. If we let the word be glorified, we've let God be glorified. If we let the Word in, we've let God in. Mm. I wish you'd lift your hands and praise God. And remember that you're praising the God who wrote the Word and the God who is the Word. This is a supernatural book. At the end of his life, Paul begins to write. And he begins to write to young men. Because like you already heard this morning, young men need direction from elders and young men are powerful for God. And so if you watch the New Testament, you'll figure it out that one third of the New Testament is either written to Timothy or by Paul and Timothy. Read chapter 1 verse 1 of all the epistles and count them up. One third of the New Testament was either directed to this young man or written by this young man and Paul. So don't tell us that we can isolate the younger generation until they get to be whatever you pick the age, 40, 50, 60, 70, and finally all of a sudden we're just going to let them loose and they'll do what they're supposed to do. We need to invest our energy, our time, our conferences, all of that in this younger generation of ministers because they're powerful because they happen to be preaching the same word that the older generation is preaching. They happen to believe it and they happen to love it and so Paul writes to Timothy and by now Paul's a mess by any standard he's been arrested he's been beaten he's been stoned he's been and not in the modern sense of the word he's been left for dead Everything's happened to Paul. It looks like his whole ministry has gone in reverse. He's backing up by the world's standards. He's been confined to prison. Paul is not in a good place here. And he writes to his young friend Timothy. And as you read some of those epistles, you can feel the loneliness in Paul's words. You can feel the isolation in his words when he asks somebody, would you please bring my cloak? It's cold. Winter's coming. 
Would you please bring my parchments? He has nothing. He's nothing in the world's eyes. He's powerless. They've locked him up and thrown away the key. But then in his last written epistle to this young man who is his protege, he writes this in 2 Timothy, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. Timothy, they locked me up, they tied me up, and they threw away the key. But there's one thing that still hasn't been bound. I may be bound, but the word of God is not bound. I may be locked up, but the word of the Lord is not locked up. I may be a little depressed, but the word of the Lord is full of encouragement. I'd like to say to somebody in this room today, you may feel bound. You may look bound. You may have every circumstance going against you, but the word is not bound if you let the word loose in your life. If you've got a Bible, I wish you'd put it in one of those hands that's lifted up and just worship God for a minute. I'm not talking about the 23-second average Pentecostal praise. I'm talking about, God, I believe your word. I trust in it. I stand on it. Let your voice out apostolic. Let I release your word in this place right now, God. I release your word in this place right now, God. He's sending his word to heal somebody in this place today, just as sure as I'm standing here. You may be bound, but the word, the word, the word, the word, the word is not bound. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. You know this one. We quote it all the time. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And here's what it does, and here's how it acts. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Here's how powerful this word is. You evangelists, you already know this. You do this all the time. The word is so powerful. You are three parts, body, soul, spirit. Soul is the ancient equivalent of our modern word mind. Your soul contains everything that makes you uniquely you. Your personality, your will, your intellect, your memories, your personality, your stubborn temper or whatever it is that makes you you. That's your soul. And the word is so powerful that when it is preached, it is so sharp that it divides asunder between the carnal earthly part of you, your mind and your spirit. It divides between soul and spirit. Don't look at me like you don't already know that because that's what happened the first time you came to that weird Pentecostal church and you didn't intend to feel what you felt and you didn't intend to go to the altar like you did and you certainly didn't intend to talk in tongues or get baptized in Jesus' name. You lived the way you lived 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years but the preacher got preaching not his own opinion, not a religious lecture, but he got preaching the Word of God, and it's so sharp. It got between the part of you that had thought in those mental patterns for 30 or 40 or 50 years, and it loosed your spirit to realize there's more to life than this. There's more to tomorrow than this. And so when the Word that was preached by the man of God cut between your soul and your spirit, your spirit got hungry. Your spirit realized it was empty and Pentecostals, apostolics, if we could ever just go back to that first love that we have for the Lord, that first love that we had for the Word. We need in the 21st century apostolic church the Word to cut between carnal thinking and politics and gossip and all the junk and the trivia that we involve ourselves in, even in the church, and we just need the word to slice us away from that so we can walk in the spirit and live in the spirit and be a people of the spirit. 
Now that's powerful. That's Logos. Everyone say Logos. That's the total revelation of the Word of God. But if you back up ten verses, you'll find Hebrews 4 and 2. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the Logos that was preached did not profit them. Why? Because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. Jesus said something very similar in Mark 7. You make the Word, the Logos, the beautiful, total revelation of God. You make the Word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered. And many such things do ye. First Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul alludes to this. He said, our gospel didn't come unto you in Logos only. Paul said, I didn't just give you a list of scriptures. I didn't just give you a list of key doctrines that you could quote and memorize and regurgitate. I didn't just give you Logos. Our gospel didn't come unto you just in that. It also came in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And so there's a transition in the New Testament. If you're a saint of God in a local church, would you lift your hand in this auditorium right now? I want to talk to you for the next few minutes if you'll receive this. There's a turn in the New Testament. It's not just for the preachers. The New Testament isn't just written to your preacher so he can entertain you for an hour on Sunday morning or Sunday night. The Word of the Lord is the guidebook. It is the owner's manual for the human heart and every saint of God. You don't need a a relationship with the Word of God through your pastor. You need a relationship with the Word of God for yourself. My pastor believes this apostolic message great and big deal. You've got to believe this apostolic message. My pastor is a man of the word great and big deal. You've got to be a person of the word. You can attend an apostolic church for a hundred years and if the word never penetrates below your ears then you're not living the way God intended you to live. Because there's a sharp turn in the word of God. And the Word of God doesn't just refer to itself as the total revelation of all we believe, the faith that was first delivered to the saints. It also refers to itself in this way. And Paul makes the turn for us in Ephesians 6 and 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And he doesn't say Logos. He says Rima. Rima is not the total revelation of all the wonderful doctrines that we know and believe and love and that are so powerful and life-changing. Rima is a specific word from God that comes into a specific circumstance, into a specific moment in your life, and that Rima word sustains you and turns you around and gets you through it. Rima is your daily relationship with the Word of God. So Paul said, you need to take the sword of the Spirit, the sword Lord of the Spirit is not a list of key Pentecostal doctrines. The sword of the Spirit is that you got your nose and your face and your heart into the Word of God today for yourself and God is speaking to you today from His Word because you can't beat the devil by quoting some scriptures off a dusty old chart that you learned in Sunday school but you can pulverize the devil by saying you get behind me because this is what God said to me this morning this is how God is dealing with me today if you got a Bible please lift it high I'm sorry to get in your face but that's your sword If you never see that sword from week to week or preacher from sermon to sermon, you're not doing it right. I need to rewind that one. I'm sorry. If you're only seeing this book 
If you're only learning from this book, if you're only excited about this book when you're in this building or some similar building, then you're doing it wrong. Preacher, if the only time this book's cracked open is when you're trying to figure out your next sermon thought, you're doing it wrong with all respect and all humility, but you're doing it wrong. That's not the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is a now word from God. It's a today word from God. It's a right now interaction with the God who wrote the word. So Pentecostal troops, would you take your sword and lift it high and lift up a shout to the God who gave you the most powerful weapon in the universe? Yes, yes. That's your sword. Don't let it get dusty. Don't let it get rusty. That's your sword. Jesus used this sword. If he had to use it, I dare say you might have to use it. If he overcame using this, then I believe it might be obligatory for you to overcome using this. Matthew 4, verse 4, Jesus is in the wilderness, 40 days of fasting. You know the whole story. And he's resisting the devil because the devil is coming to him to bring him temptations. And he resists the devil not by being God in flesh. I'm so glad he didn't do that. God in flesh. He could have zapped the devil out of existence, call a lightning bolt down, open the earth. He could have done anything. I'm so glad Jesus didn't beat the devil by being God. He beat the devil in his humanity using the Word of God. And here's why I'm glad. I can't replicate lightning bolts from heaven. And it's probably a good thing, me being a pastor and all, that I can't duplicate or replicate lightning bolts from heaven because I wouldn't just use them on the devil. There are times I would send them strategically into a service and come up from under a pew and just lift somebody right clear. How we'd say it in New Brunswick. But Jesus didn't beat the devil calling down lightning from heaven. Jesus beat the devil by doing something that I can replicate. He answered and said, Matthew 4 and 4, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. And he reaches back and he quotes Moses. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's not Logos, by the way. That's Rima. Jesus used a specific word out of the total word. He used a Rima word out of the Logos word to beat the devil. That's why that immediate now word is the sword of the Spirit. I'm not arguing with anything. I'm not trying to make a point or make some big parade or charade up here. But you can holler about all the wonderful doctrines that we heard preached this morning. And if you're not living in the Word of God every day, that's just something that Brother Dylan knows. That's just something that Brother Chavis believes. But if you've had your nose and your face and your heart into the Word of God, then I don't have to call Brother Dylan to bring his sword to fight my battle. That's why we've got so many dysfunctional, depressed Pentecostals in the 21st century. It's because their idea of living for God is showing up, living the standards, and putting something in the collection plate. And that is so far beneath your privilege as a child of God. You've been equipped with the same sword that your pastor has. You've got the same sword that Brother Huntley has. You You've got the same sword. So the point is to use your sword. And your sword's only your sword if you were in it today. A now word from God. I'm almost finished. You can be seated. John 6, 63, Jesus said, It's the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The rema The rima, the now word, the right now word, the today word, the current word, the rima that I speak to you. They are spirit and they are life. 
This is one of my favorite chapters in the Word of God. I, I told you yesterday I'm preaching a series on the book of Acts. I don't know how many weeks this chapter is going to be, but chapter 10. Because if there wasn't a chapter 10 in Acts, there wouldn't be any of this. Cornelius is the first Gentile that's brought into the apostolic truth. Other than that, it was a Jewish church, and, and to be honest, the Jews preferred to keep it that way. But because there was a man named Cornelius, and while the church was going through the day of Pentecost, Cornelius was still praying, God, send somebody. God, I believe in you, but I don't know what to do. And while they were praying in the Holy Ghost on the streets of Jerusalem, Cornelius was praying. And while the lame man was being healed at the temple, Cornelius was still praying. And while the place was being shaken under the power of the Holy Ghost in Acts 4, Cornelius was still praying. And while Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead, Cornelius was still praying. And while Stephen preached his sermon and got stoned for it, Cornelius was still praying. And while Philip went to Samaria, Cornelius was still praying. And while Saul met the Lord on the road to Damascus, Cornelius was still praying. And that Gentile man with such a hunger for God, it took 10 chapters. But Peter finally got there under protest. And when he walked in the door, here's what happened. Verse 44, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. Guess what? That's Rima. Peter didn't go with a little can message. Peter didn't go with some little doctrinal statement. Peter didn't go with some handbook. Peter went and spoke what God was speaking. And when you speak what God is speaking, that's the result. And because there was a Cornelius, and because there's an Acts 10, there's Woodlawn, and there's impact. And there's United Pentecostal Church. And it all goes back to one man that wouldn't stop getting hungry and another man that even though he was there under protest, he went and he spoke the word that God was speaking to him. You tell anybody you want. Tell your friends in other denominations. There wouldn't be a Baptist church. There wouldn't be a Wesleyan church. There wouldn't be an Anglican church. There wouldn't be Church of God. There wouldn't be anything else if it hadn't been for talking in tongues. Because there wouldn't be any Gentiles in the church if it hadn't been for speaking in tongues. Because the only reason they let Cornelius in the church is they said, we heard them speak with tongues. So Peter came back to the council and said, what were we to do? They received the Holy Ghost the same as we did at the beginning. So would you stop hanging your head about being a Pentecostal? There wouldn't be any Christianity if it hadn't been for speaking in tongues. That's the power of a now word from God. That's the power of the Rima word. I really am almost done. Music, come back. Luke chapter 5, verse 5. Peter answering Jesus. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. The disciples, all the way through the gospel, these people that are full-time, commercial, professional fishermen, every time you read about in the gospels, they can't catch a fish to save their life. And so again, they've been out all night and taken nothing. That's what Peter said to Jesus. Watch this. Nevertheless, Jesus. Man, I wish I could get this in somebody's spirit today. Nevertheless, Jesus, we've looked at an impossible circumstance all night. We, the professional paid fishermen, are now talking with you, the carpenter, the landlocked carpenter. But, but we have done our thing all night, and we've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. That's Rima. Jesus, if you give me a specific command, I will go to the wall for it. I will go to the wall on it. I will fight the battle till the last drop of bread on it. You, all you have to do, Jesus, is speak the word. Has anybody heard a word from God anywhere in the last 48 hours in this meeting? Has anybody heard a word from God in one of the sermons that's been preached? So what's lacking is not the word. All that's lacking is you to say, God, at your word, I'll go do that. At your word, I'll go be that. At your word, I'll go speak that. I know how this works. I've been around for a long time, I think. 
Psalm 105, back to our text. You can stand if you want. He sent a man before them, even Joseph. He was sold for a servant. His feet they hurt with fetters. These are details that aren't even in the Genesis account. Joseph was forever marked by having his feet in fetters in the dungeon. He was chained up like an animal. And then the Bible says he was laid in iron. Literally in the Hebrew, iron entered into his soul. Our modern equivalent would be the heavens were brass for Joseph. He cried out to God. He'd received the greatest, grandest vision of the Old Testament up to that point. And nothing. He'd gone backwards nothing. He went backwards when they dropped him in a pit. He went backwards when they sold him into slavery. He went backwards when they put him in Potiphar's house. He went backwards when the wife of Potiphar accused him and he was cast into prison. He went backwards when the butler and the beggar, they ignored all of that and they, they got their dream answered but they left Joseph rotting in the dungeon. He went backward and backward and backward but he didn't realize that his destination wasn't there. His destination was there. So he might have been feeling like he was going backwards but Joseph was moving into the direct will of God for his life would you please let me speak a word in the Holy Ghost to you the Bible says in Psalm 105 verse 19 until the time that his word came the word of the Lord tried him it put him to the test there are people, there are ministers there are pastors and wives there are evangelists and home missionaries in this room and the word God has spoken into your spirit is a grand word. You hardly dare speak it to anybody but your closest friends because you're awed that God could ever think that you could be part of a dream that grand. Please let me tell you something. That word is true. God spoke to Daniel. He said, the thing is true but the time is long. It's not your time frame and you feel like you're stepping backwards and you go to do something and it feels like you go backwards and the heavens are brass and it seems like everybody else does it faster and better and easier. I came to this last afternoon session to tell you that until the word comes true and you see the final impact of it back here, what you need to do is continue to walk in the word, continue to trust the word, continue to stay in the word because the word's going to put you to the test. The same word that delivers you eventually is going to try you today. The same word that's going to bless your life and everybody else, that word is going to put your faith to the test before you get there. And sometimes you'll feel like you're walking backwards. And sometimes you'll feel like you're dropping down. And sometimes you'll feel like all of those things. But if God has spoken a word into your spirit, If God has spoken a word into your ministry, Jesus, at thy word, I'll let down the net. At thy word, I'll push it to the metal. At thy word, I'll go to the mat. At thy word. I wish you'd lift up your sword right now. I wish you'd lift up your sword right now. The Holy Ghost is talking in this room. We've emphasized young ministers today. And I want to ask those young ministers, however you define young, I don't really care. But I'm not trying to make a a joke here. Young ministers, I'd like you to join me right at the front as quickly as you can. Because God has his hand on our young ministers. God has his hand on the next generation of ministers. And young men that stand in pulpits like these two did today and preach the Word of God like these two did today, they're going to be maligned and misunderstood and mocked and mischaracterized, and they're going to have a lot of opposition. But the Word of the Lord is in our next generation of ministers. And now everybody else. Would you come? Saints of God, I haven't forgotten you. God wants you to take your sword. Stop letting your pastor fight all your battles for you. You can't fight this war only doing it part-time. On Sunday, you've got to have a daily relationship with the Word of God for yourself. Now, ladies and gentlemen, would you grab somebody, anybody by the hand and lift that hand with yours? And would you begin to pray? If you've got a Bible in your hand, lift that too. That's perfect. 
Shosha sha sha bari ata la bossa. Shosha bari ata la bossa e saba. Shosha bari ata la bossa e saba. Sora bala teba. At your word, Jesus, I know it was you that spoke that word through that man, through that sermon, through that conference, through that camp meeting, through that youth camp. I know it was you. And at your word, at your word, I'll do it. I wouldn't do it for anybody else. I do it, wouldn't do it for any other reason. But at your word, I'm going to stand on your word that you spoke into my life. I'm going to stand on your word. There are immense dreams that have been birthed in the supernatural, in the ministries that are represented here. There are magnificent futures birthed in the supernatural because of the word that's been spoken into somebody's life. So Oh, I wish some of you that feel it, you just start moving through and praying one for another. Would you do that? Would you start praying one for another right now? Yes, yes. In Jude, we find him writing in verse 3, I wanted to write of our common salvation. But he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.